Are you everybody? We bring talk about a test. Yeah. Not sure that's an option. I would love to give everybody A's on the test. That would be that would be a great thing. I would love to be able to give everybody. I would love to give everybody A's for the entire class. I only ever get to go to college in my OCHEM class, and it's usually like four from four. Um, but. Unfortunately, you've got to earn that. I don't think you just give grades. You earn the grades. So, I know. It's rough. Um, I did realize, I realized I didn't post the uh, the key yet. Um, so, I posted the key. It's just attached to the to the assignment in uh, in Canvas. So, when you go to the, to the assignment on Canvas, um, now it has PDF of the practice test and then the key as well. So you can check all your answers on that for anything we don't get to today. Um, I will say I I did write out the uh, the definitions here, but really what I'm looking for on the definitions is just show me that you understand the concept. It can be just an equation. If I asked you about density and you wrote mass over volume, just M over V, that's a full credit answer. Doesn't have to be complete sentences. Just show me you know what I'm talking about. Um, other than that, um, does anybody have any particular parts of the practice test that you wanted to talk about? Let's talk about number eight. All right. So, what was tricky about this one? This the middle leaders part. The middle leaders. Yeah, that was the very last thing we asked, right? Was uh, was concentration. So this this is probably going to be the biggest stretch. Um, but remember that, that concentrations is just another way of getting the moles for these stoichiometry questions, right? So if, you, if you're given a volume and a concentration, you just have to remember what does the capital M mean? Oh. Moles per liter. per liter, not just moles. The, abbreviate, the unit for moles is MOL, right? Capital M is moles over liters. So you have everything. As long as you can get to liters and you have a molarity, that's all you need to get to moles. And frankly, it's actually easier than using mass, right? There's a reason that we, we put our concentrations in moles per liter because it makes these really straightforward because everybody can go from milliliters to liters, right? And then using that concentration to go from liters to moles this is easy as, so 250.5 milliliters. What's the conversion for milliliters to liters? 1,000 milliliters is one liter. And I'll remind you, every time you do one of these prefix conversions or one of the, the easy conversions on the test, one of the ones we've been practicing, Double check yourself to make sure you didn't do something dumb like say a hundred or a thousand liters is one milliliter. Um, it's really easy to mix those up, right? So just double check on those. The other one that everybody always mixes up when they're on the test, not everybody, um, but the other common mistake that people kick themselves over is putting 2.54 inches is one centimeter instead of the other way around. Right, so just pay attention to when you're writing down these conversions and that make sure that even the easy conversions make sense. And then once you get liters, we can just say one liter is 0 0.105 moles of NaOH. 
right? So anytime you're trying to figure out, trying to get to moles from my concentration, this is going to be your, your standard conversion, right? Um, the only way it could get any more comp, any trickier is if I didn't give you milliliters, if I gave you something like cups or ounces, but I'm not going to do that to you on the test. All right, so then we can get to moles of both of these. And I get I get 0 0.0263 moles of NaOH this way. Then do the same thing for the nitric acid, right? 275.0 milliliters, 1,000 milliliters, it's one liter, and one liter is 0 0.102 moles of the nitric acid. We can do that, all of that before we even actually look at what the question is, because we know the first step in any of these stoichiometry problems is just get everything into moles. And then you don't need to worry about. Then we can look at it and say, okay, I guess we skipped the balancing the reaction step. Is there anything tricky about balancing this one? Everything's ones. Acid react acid base reaction. We haven't done reaction types yet. Um We'll find out that acid base reactions frequently are, are everything with a one. So it's what is the excess reactant? What's the concentration in moles per liter of the excess reactant when the reaction is over? How are we going to figure that out? What's going to run out first? Uh, yeah, the sodium hydroxide. That's really easy when everything's one to one, right? Once you get it in moles, whatever you have less of is what you're running out of. So if we're gonna run, if we're gonna use up all of our sodium hydroxide, this is not a step that you need to show necessarily for this particular problem. But if it's not a, if everything's not a one to one ratio, this can be a helpful. Um, or even necessary step to show. We've got moles of NaOH. For every one mole of NaOH, what are we going to write for the top here? Every time one mole of NaOH is used, one mole exactly. one mole of nitric acid used. So when it's a one-to-one -one ratio, that's really kind of a, not really super important mathematically to show, but it helps us understand what's going on, keep track of what we're doing, right? So if we actually started with 0 0.0281 moles of HNO3, And we're going to use 0 0.0263, finding out the moles that are left over is the simplest subtracting. Zero, zero, one eight, I think. I think subtraction where you have to borrow in my head. I'm, I'm never quite sure if I have it. I think that's right. Is that our final answer? Now, what else do we need? 
Not for this one. This is not a full uh, reaction study. It just says what's the final concentration of the excess. So we've got point. We've got moles left, but the question is asking us what's the molarity. What are the two parts of concentration? Is always. What is, what are the units on it? Moles over liters, right? We know how many moles are left over. That's what's going to go on the top. What's our final volume at the end? So, and I'll, we use uh, square brackets in chemistry to indicate molarity. So we can say what, molarity of what? So we're going to have leftover nitric acid. So our final concentration of HNO3 is equal is 0 0.018, 0, 0, 0.018. And then we just need a volume on the bottom in liters. What is our final volume? Think about what this reaction is doing. We're taking 250 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide 275 milliliters of the HNO3, and we're mixing them together, right? So what's our final volume? Yeah, you just put both of them together. Our final volume is 250.5 plus 275.0. So 525.5. That's milliliters, so we want to put divide by a thousand, put it in liters. That's gonna give us our final concentration. Should be roughly double point zero zero one eight, right? So zero point zero. Zero four or so. Zero point zero three. Boom, final answer. All right, so don't try to do too much for these for these stoichiometry problems. Don't overthink it. It's only asking you to do an excess reactant. It doesn't ask, it's not asking at all about theoretical yield. Percent yield, none of that. It just says, what's your final concentration? That's your final concentration. And I think for most people, the concentration one's gonna be the hardest question on the test. Uh, second hardest, anyway. There's the wild card question is usually the one people struggle with the most. There's one question that's going to be some sort of word problem, like this one. It's going to be something that I'm going to give you that, you, that makes you think on your feet a little bit. But, yeah, we can do this one. Okay. Let's hold up on the wild card question though for one second. Let me finish finish something about number eight. Okay. The only other way I could ask a question like this that's um with the uh volume, the final volume, is if we added a solid to a solution. So if we added a solid to a solution, how do we figure out the final concentration? So let's say instead of the um, NaOH as a solution, let's say that I added, um, I don't know, 0 0.142 grams plus the nitric acid, uh, 275.0 milliliters. 
at a known concentration. If we have a system like this, what's our final volume going to be? We still want to get it to moles per liter. Everything's the same. We're going to have to go from grams to moles using molecular weight. But what does that do to our final volume at the end? It's not 525 liters anymore. If you take a handful of salt and you add it to a pot of water to boil pasta, does that does adding the salt, does it change the volume of the water? No. So our final volume is just 275 milliliters in this case. So this one's even easier. You just don't have to add two volumes together because you're adding a solid to a liquid. You would, it would just, your final volume, this number would just be 0.275 instead of adding the two volumes together. Might be something like that. All right, any other questions about concentration before we move on? Okay, so we can work through number 10. Number 10, it's not going to be the same number 10. It's going to be a different word problem. Okay, so just want to make that clear. The whole point of number of the practice test is that 90% of the test is going to be really predictable, right? One through nine, you know it's going to be vocab. You know it's going to be sig figs. You know it's going to be all those questions in the same order. The only thing that's unpredictable is number 10, right? And so that if you should be able to, if you've been doing all the homework assignments and, and working and doing the practice test, you should be able to get a B on the test without even touching number 10, right? If you can do okay on one through nine, you should be probably in, in the 80 range without even touching number 10. That's maybe overly optimistic, but my point here is just that you sh that number 10, if you can't think on your feet on the test, if you freeze up, you've got test anxiety, number 10 is the stretch question. Just know that. Don't let that get you down. Don't focus on that. Focus on the stuff you do know how to do. So with that in mind... You don't know what you're looking at. Does that matter for this one? Do we actually need to know what kind of reaction this is? Does the reaction matter whatsoever? No, because it just says uranium-235 is naturally found in a certain concentration. How much energy could be produced based on all these numbers? So it doesn't matter what the balance reaction is. All that matters is that you have a certain amount of uranium and a certain amount of soil. How much energy are you going to get out of that uranium? So for these word problems, for these conversion word problems, where should we start? There's a bunch of numbers in there. Yeah. So most of these numbers that are in this word problem here are part of a conversion, right? Like you've got grams per mole, that's a conversion, right? You've got uranium, 0 0.042 grams of uranium per thousand kilograms of soil. That's a conversion too, right? And then you've got one number in here that's not part of a conversion. 150 kilograms of soil. That's the amount we're starting from. That's how much we have. All the other numbers in here are conversions, basically. So if we start with a mass of soil, we can use kilograms of soil to get to grams of uranium.
And if we can get to grams of uranium, we've got this 1.95 times 10 to the 10 kilojoules per mole number. We don't really know necessarily what that means, but we know it could be used as a conversion, right? If we have, if we can get to grams of uranium, we can get to moles of uranium. If we get to moles of uranium, we can get to kilojoules. So how are we going to, how are we going to do each of these steps? How do we go from kilograms of soil to grams of uranium? Yeah, we're going to treat it like a conversion. And what ratio are we going to use? One thousand kilograms of soil is zero point zero four two grams of uranium. This is fun, fun fact about uranium: uranium is actually pretty uniformly distributed through the, through the Earth's crust. There's not actually like uranium-rich areas for the most part. There's small amounts of uranium present in pretty much all of the Earth's crust. So are there like uranium mines? I've heard like Czech Republic had our Czech. Yeah. yeah, a lot of uranium mines. My, my wife has a family friend who sells uranium as his job. He's a uranium salesman, literally. So he goes and wines and dines um, pop, you know, energy companies and foreign governments um, and sells uranium. And he, they're based out of um, Saskatchewan, I think. Uh, but basically, anywhere that you don't mind having an open pit mine, you can mine uranium there. Marie Curie got most of her early samples were from Africa, um, but you can get them from Eastern Europe, Northern Canada, basically any place where it's not a problem environmentally to have a mine. I saw a question over here. How much would a grand uranium cost? I don't even know. Oh, uh, it's very, very strictly uh, regulated. Yeah. Um, although it's buying the uranium is not the tricky part, it's actually the refining the, and enriching the uranium. And that's the part where the UN gets involved and makes sure that you're not actually making nuclear weapons and things like that. I should bring some for a lab. Uh, we have some radioactive samples at the college, or at least we did. They were mostly decayed, but they basically sell them for labs in these little like plastic coins, this high density plastic. It's like the shape of a coin um, that has a like, one little dot of it embedded in the middle um, so that you can hold them without directly coming into contact with them so you don't give yourself radiation poisoning. Uh, I'll see if we still have those. We might have gotten rid of those because they were not, a lot of them were no longer giving off as much radiation as they were supposed to. But um, any other any other question, follow-up questions on the radiation thing? We'll spend a whole a whole um, chapter talking about nuclear reactions in the second half of the class. So you'll get more info on that when we get closer. All right, back to the problem at hand. If we've got grams of uranium now, because now we're going to have kilograms of soil, cancel out kilograms of soil, we'll be in grams of uranium. What's our next step? Get to moles. Yeah, so 235.04 grams of uranium. That's given. So, and this one's a little bit tricky because it's not the same mass that's on the periodic table, right? Because uranium, the periodic mass, um, the atomic mass on the table is mostly uranium-238 because that's the form that's more commonly found in nature. So this is uranium-235, which has a higher energy density which is why it gets used for nuclear reactors. So you have to use the mass that's in the problem for this one, but it is given to you. So that gets us the moles of uranium. Now we can go from moles of uranium to kilojoules because we're given a number. This reaction produces 1.95 times 10 to the 10 kilojoules per mole.
our final answer because it specifically says in megajoules is then to convert kilojoules to megajoules. How many kilojoules are in a megajoule? A thousand, or you can take kilojoules, convert it to joules, and then joules back to megajoules. So we could say just 10 to the three kilojoules is one joule, and then say one joule is 10 to the six megajoules. It's a net result of multiplying by a thousand either way, because there's a thousand kilojoules in a megajoule. Did I do that backwards? Oh, I did the same thing that I warned you about. A thousand kilojoules is one joule? No, that's backward, huh? One kilojoule is a thousand joules. See, it's easy to do. And then it's 10 to the six joules is one megajoule. Does that look better? So for these word problems for number 10, it's gonna be some type of word problem. Most of it's probably gonna be able to be written as a, as a conversion. There might be something um, with uh, wavelength or frequency. There might be something with densities. Um, I'm not going to ask you. There might be, I'll, I'll leave it out there, um, a, an easy ge uh, geometry relationship, something like, like volume and length uh, of a sheet of foil. Like we did in that, that problem back from our word problems page. It's going to be one something like those, not as complicated as the black hole problem. Maybe as complicated as the how long is your sheet of aluminum problem. Right? That's, that's sort of the level of geometry that might be involved. But it's probably going to be mostly just a, a long conversion like this. All right. Just for context also. This number here is exactly why nuclear reactors, nuclear power plants are so, so important um, and so powerful is this reaction, this energy per mole. So, you know, the next best reaction that we have that we use on a regular basis for energy is basically just burning stuff, right? Like fossil fuels or coal. This number for, for uh, burning octane in, in an internal combustion engine is like maybe, I think it's about 2000 kilojoules per mole of octane. And this is, so this is roughly 10 to the eight times more energy per mole. What is 10 to the eight? Yeah, big number, a hundred million times. A hundred million times more energy per mole in a nuclear reaction than just simply burning octane. All right. Any other questions on the wild card? Part no, because it's going to be blind, right? Yeah. That's all you, if you then take this, plug it into your calculator, that's all you need to do to answer the question. All right, sorry, B has, I forgot it was it was B, not a bonus. Um, and then it says the average household in California uses two times ten to the three megajoules each month. How many days can you can you power a household with this much energy? So another long conversion. Lila? Yeah. I would do 12 months equals 365 days as the conversion. But your conversion sheet has time conversions on it. Not, we'll talk about what those mean when we get to nuclear chemistry, but no, not really. The 92 is just that's how many protons there are in one nucleus for uranium. Um, but it is a little redundant. Right, so how are we going to answer B? What's our roadmap going to be for B? 
We're already in megajoules, right? That's megajoule. Well, I meant the the amount of energy in 150 kilograms of soil is we're already in megajoules from part A, right? So we'll have a number in megajoules, and then we can go from megajoules to months, and then months to days. So if you use your answer from part A, this one's actually a much shorter conversion, right? Whatever this number winds up being, which I check the key here, so I could... it's something like five five point two times ten to the two megajoules. That's our answer from part A, and then we can say. Two point oh two times ten to the three megajoules is one month. You could do something like one month is thirty days. That would get you close. The better way to do that to use your conversions is to say that there's twelve months in a year, and there's three hundred and sixty-five point two four days in a year. then we're not assuming 30 days in a month. We're just saying we, there's always 12 months in a year and there's 365.24 days in a year. I think it comes out to be something like 15 days, 7.8 days. If this conversion doesn't make sense to you, break it up and go to years first. Go months to years. And then you can say one year is 365.24 days. Yeah. Any, any, anytime you can say that the top of a fraction is equal to the bottom of a fraction, then that's a conversion, right? So you can just combine these that way. Fun note about days in the year. That's why we have leap days. Is that that's and why leap days happen every how many day, how many years? Because every four years, this 0.24 adds up to about an extra day. Except it's not 0.25, it's 0.24. Which is why every hundred years we don't have a leap day. So every hundred years, if you just do a leap year or a leap day every four years, every hundred years you'll be off by a day because it's 0.24, not 0.25. So in 2100, we won't have a leap day. We didn't have a leap day in 2000, which was for all your time anyway. So, but so you'll have to wait a long time to see a leap year that doesn't have a leap day. All right. Any other questions about the practice test? Any other parts that you want to go over? No, sir. No, sir. You want to just work on it in small groups? That's pretty. We'll all walk around and answer questions as we go. All right, we got one more here. Hang on, Lila. Electron geometries. Yeah. All right. So, what's our process for these? How do we get to a molecular geometry? It kind of lays out the steps for you. What's the first thing we're going to have to do? Lewis dot structure. So count your electrons, your total valence electrons. Put your least electronegative element in the middle. Nitrogen's going to go in the middle. Bingo.
So nitrogen is going to go in the middle. Hydrogen, hydrogen, fluorine. Count up our total valence electrons. So that's going to be five electrons from the nitrogen plus two times one electron for the hydrogen plus seven electrons, valence electrons for the fluorine. 14. 14 total valence electrons. Then what's the next thing we do? Bonds. Distribute. Do the bonds first, right? That's going to use up six of them. So we're back to, we're down to eight electrons left. Where do we start with those eight electrons now? The fluorine, right? We start at the outside. The hydrogens are good, right? Hydrogens already have full valences, but typically what we've been doing is you start at the outside and you work your way in. There's not really a wrong way to do it. You could start at the middle and work your way out too. Um, it just usually makes more sense if you start out and work your way in. So fluorine needs another six electrons. Right, that gives fluorine a total. And now we've got two electrons left. And the only place where you can put them is on the nitrogen. So everything's got a full valence. We use the right number of electrons. What's our last criteria to know if we did it right? Normal charge, very good. How do we know that the nitrogen goes in the middle and not the fluorine? It just does. In theory, that looks, that meets our first two criteria just as well, right? But the charges are going to be off. How do we get formal charge? Count the number of electrons it owns, right? Remember, bonds count for half. So this nitrogen owns five electrons a pair that it owns outright and then half of each of these and how many electrons does nitrogen own on the periodic table five so that gives us a formal charge of zero it owns five electrons now and when it's on the periodic table it had five electrons What about the what about this nitrogen? How many electrons does this nitrogen own? Seven. So it has two extra electrons. So what's the formal charge on this nitrogen? Two minus, because electrons are negative. What about the fluorine? How many electrons does the fluorine own here? Seven, and how many does it have on the periodic table? Seven. So everything's got a formal charge of zero on this side, which is how we know we put our, our nitrogen in the right spot. Because over here, now this fluorine owns five. And it had seven on the periodic table, which gives it what charge? A plus two charge. This is not as stable of a structure because your formal charges are not as close to zero. Your hydrogens are still zero for both of them. But this is the better structure because your formal charges are all zero. All right. Now, the part that we've spent less time on, or there's a little bit more recent anyway, What's the electron geometry of the nitrogen? Trigonal plane or why? Felt like a good answer? I mean, it's multiple choice, basically. So you, it's one of five things. No, nope, it didn't work for you. How many things are taking up space around the nitrogen? 
four. This pair counts as one thing because they're both together, right? So that means it's electron geometry is tetrahedral. What's the mole? Rim? You're allowed to draw it. How would we draw this one? Two things have to be in the plane of the board. One thing going back. In the same general area, one thing coming forward. Doesn't matter what you put at each of, end of each of these. The And the alone pair doesn't have to be in the plane of the board. I could put the lone pair here, but because it's hard to draw a lone pair at the end of a wedge or, or dashes, I typically do put the lone pair in the plane of the board, but it doesn't really matter. So if that's our electron geometry, what's our molecular geometry? Trigonal pyramid. Because everything's still in the same spot, the only difference between molecular geometry and electron geometry is you can't see the lone pairs. So you take the same drawing and erase any lone pairs. Everything still stays in the same spot because the lone, the lone pair is still there taking up space. We just can't see it. Trigonal pyramid. How do we feel about these? Did, the, did that lab last Thursday? Was that helpful for yeah. getting some of the studying done? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, we can do the next one. So, for IF3, how many valence electrons do we have? Seven times four, right? Twenty eight. seven electrons from the iodine, and then seven electrons from each fluorine, and there's three of them. So seven times four, 28 electrons total. What's gonna go in the middle, iodine or fluorine? Iodine. Because fluorine will never go in the middle. Fluorine is the most electronegative element, right? So you will never see fluorine in the middle. At most, you might see fluorine like this, you could consider fluorine the central atom if you looked at hydrofluoric acid. But even that, it's just not really central, it's just in the middle of, or it's just one end of a diatomic molecule. Start with your bonds. Only two electrons left. Filling up the valences for all of the fluorines is going to use up how many more? Four. Except we already used, filled these up, right? So we need six more on each fluorine. So six times three is 18. So how many electrons are left? Four. Uh, four. four. Where do they go? Oh, so They've got to go on the iodine. Fluorines all already have eight electrons now, right? And you can't go past the octet rule for anything in the second row. So 
the only place that we can put these is on the iodine. And if we are looking at our formal charges, this will also give us a formal charge of zero on everything. Violet? Because remember, anything in the third row of the periodic table or lower has a d orbital, even if it's empty. So you can start adding electrons into a d orbital, even though it's it's fine with only eight electrons. Yeah. But if we have two more that we need to put on there, we can stick them on the iodine. So the octet rule is more of a more of a suggestion for the third row of the periodic table and below. So what's our electron geometry then? How many electron domains do we have? Five. Five. Trigonal. Bipyramidal. And if we were drawing this, it's going to look like right, it's basically trigonal planar. The fluorines are trigonal planar. And actually, I, that's actually not correct, huh? I have to put one of the lone pairs over here. So our, uh, actually, both of them have to go in the equatorial position. So I've done that to make it look like the one that's in the board when they, uh, So if we're drawing it, it would look like this, which makes your molecular geometry then. What is that shape? T-shaped. It might be more obviously T-shaped if I change where I draw those lone pairs. If I draw one lone pair into the board, one lone pair coming out of the board. That's the same shape I just drew. I just switched some of the things around the middle, right? And then when you erase these, we get this shape. Yeah. All right. How are we feeling about geometries? A little bit better? If you get good at drawing the, the, or the electron geometries, everything else is based around those, right? So if you get that first column on that table really good, then just all you have to do if you have lone pairs is you're just going to erase some of the spots there once you draw. Right. So I would work on drawing those first. Did I see a hand over here before I started talking? Okay. All right. How are we feeling? All right. Good to be there. Or yeah, want to be here. That's fine. I'll start. Cool. Thank you. After school, you did it. Yep. Okay. All right, how are we doing? Fantastic. All right. I think what we'll do now is we'll, we'll work on this in small groups. Does everybody have a copy of this to work on? Yeah. Okay. Then I'm just going to come around, talk to small groups, if you're, and get clarification. Pull up the key if you haven't yet.
and check so you can start checking your answers. And uh, I'll answer questions as we go. If there's anything that's relevant to the whole class, I might stop everybody again, but and uh, and answer it up here. But yes. for now, let's get working on it. Oh, I